This is the Chiefs official podcast network. Take advantage of the day. When you get an opportunity in this game, you make a play. Good playmakers on three. One, two, three. Touchdown, Kansas City. The Chiefs are right in the thick of it, baby. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome once again to Defending the Kingdom. Mitch Holters with you, the voice of the Chiefs, along with my man you all know as the shop, the kingdom, the barber shop of the kingdom, uh, the Spider-Man, a uh, 10-year NFL veteran, uh, Sean Barber. And Sean, uh, first of all, it's great to see you again. Uh, it, but I got to start this with the exciting news that we've seen uh, over the last week and a half. First of all, Patrick Mahomes signing his deal, basically cementing the next decade of him being the Chiefs Kingdom quarterback. And then Chris Jones and the Chiefs able to get that done too. Uh, two high-impact players, two of the best in the league in the case of the MVP, the best in the league. Your reaction, you played in this league, you know how difficult, you've coached, you know how difficult it can be to get these things done. How excited were you over the last two weeks to see Chris Jones and Patrick Mahomes cement these deals? Man, as a former player, I think the one thing you were hoping is that we could find a way to get everybody back. We wanted to get as many guys back. Uh, we talked about running it back, going back to back. But we, we wanted to do it with as many of familiar faces uh, that know the defense, and know the culture, they know Kansas City, they know the expectation of how we practice, um, how we go about our work. And so there is, as many of those individuals we can get back in the building uh, to make a run of it, you, you feel very excited about that. But you knew it was going to be tough. Uh, when you got guys that have played at such a high level, um, you know, Chris Jones has been arguably one of the top five defensive linemen in the league over the last four or five seasons. Um, and you knew his price tag was going to be um, um, 20 plus million a year. Uh, but you also knew that you had the MVP of the Super Bowl, one of the most elite uh, arm talents we've seen um, in football history as as our quarterback. And trying to get both of those deals done in the same offseason, you got to tip your hat um, to, Pat, um, to, to coach. Coach Andy Reid to Rhett Beach um, tell us all the guys in the uh, who handled the cap for the Kansas City Chiefs. It, that was a, just an amazing, amazing accomplishment with the amount of uh, cap room they had to begin with and how creative uh, Pat, his agent, um, Chris Jones, his agent, Andy um, and Brett Beach were collectively to get both of those guys signed and actually still have room to do things in the, the, the new COVID era, because you know you got to keep some money just in case some things happen during the season. Um, and the Kansas City Chiefs organization football team is in a great position for the next three or four seasons to uh, win as many championships as possible. Yeah, my reaction is this. One, it shows the commitment. When I mean, you look at the guaranteed money of these two contracts, I mean, you're looking at like 200 million yeah. bucks. I mean, so that's the – that's. That's Clark Hunt and the ownership of this team saying, we are committed to these guys. Uh, we believe in them, and we think they're going to be productive uh, for the next several years. Two, you touched on it, but Brett Veach, and not only Brett, but his staff. You mentioned Brett Tillis. I'm gonna, Chris Shea's unbelievable. Yeah. The guy is, I mean, he's one of those, I said, hey, how you doing? And he'll give me the salary cap position of all 32 teams in four different languages. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, dude, I just said, how you doing? Like, <laughs> like, uh, like, don't look at him in the face. Don't look at him in the face. But I mean, and then Mike Borgonzi and Ryan Poles, we can go right down the line. Tim Terry, that's that's a dream team of guys in that personnel like cap management department that I don't think our fans fully appreciate. And then third was the maturity of Mahomes. I mean, this is a kid that's, I say, young, he's a young man at 24 years old, headed to 25 soon. But his maturity to say, I want to plant a flag here. Not only do I want to play football here, I want to build my life here. And I'm going to do that with, I'm going to get taken care of, but I also want to do it in an environment that we can compete in all of those 10 years. Don't just give me all the money and then we got nothing else. To me, that was profound and that Patrick Mahomes was saying, let's chart the course here, but let's chart this together because I want to make my life here, not just play football. Oh, definitely. And you look at the quarterback position, there's two ways to think about it. There's the way that Tom Brady did it. You you, yep. you, you take a little bit less to make the guys around you better. Or you do it the way that um, Aaron Rodgers, um, Drew Brees, and um, Russell Wilson did it. Where yeah, you, maximize, you maximize your, your, your potential and you say, hey, I deserve this amount. And whatever you got left over to, 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 to give me to work with, I'll, I'll continue to be a winning quarterback. I'll continue to be a winning 
uh, team, we just might not have enough uh, to get over the finish line and win championships. And so each of those guys have one or two two championships based off that philosophy. But you, look at what Tom Brady has done with those multiple championships. Um, I think it's, it's it's a proven method that if you get a young quarterback and you can extend them to a long period of time, taking a long time to give your team the flexibility to keep really high quality players, elite players all around them on both sides of the ball. Um, that's the, the recipe for success that leads to multiple championships in a short period of time. Well, let's jump in using that as a segue now to, because we've been looking at the defensive side of the ball mm -hmm. here over the last several weeks, and we're going to jump into this, the safety position, which to me, if the Chiefs don't have the best room uh, with the safeties that they have on this team, they got to be in the discussion of the top three or five. Yes. They remind me now of those Legion of Doom Seattle groups. Uh, I know that was an awesome group, Cam Chancellor and Earl Thomas and those guys. But now all of a sudden, uh, when I look at this safety group, and let's start with Tyron Matthew. When the Chiefs got him last year at the beginning of the 19 season, I have friends in the organization, the Houston Texan organization, that said, Mitch, you're getting more than you think you're getting with him. Mm -hmm. Watched him from afar. But now being around the Honey Badger for a year and a half, I see what they're saying, Shop. The Chiefs got a lot more here than a football player, a really good yeah. football player. And I'll be the first to say, when, when, I, when I examined his one year at Houston and I watched his film, he did not come off as a player who I thought on the field was an elite safety. He did, I, did, I didn't see the same Honey Badger I saw when I looked at his Cardinal film. When I watched him with the Cardinals, man, this guy was um, – he was the second coming of – of, 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 of Ed Reed. I mean, the, the playmaking ability and the leadership and everything. When he got to Houston, I kind of felt like either he was coming back off an injury, but there was something that was not, it was, it was just something that, that made me feel like there was a step missing. But turn the page to last year here with the Chiefs, um, he turned back to Dallas time. He, 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 he got in the time machine. He went back to his rookie season. He went back to the Honey Badger. The way he ball hawked, got in the minds of quarterbacks, got in the mind of his own teammates, um, led from out in front, uh, was able to make plays all over the fields, whether it was in the slot, deep safety, in the box. Um, he was a jack of all trades and was the most versatile player, I would say, defensively in the entire football league. And that type of versatility and understanding, I think it was a culmination of getting him back in a defense uh, with a coordinator like Steve Spagnola, who was able to utilize that versatility to the utmost ability. And so I, I think it was a, 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 a just a match made in heaven to get him back in that kind of role that, that, that really took advantage of, of how versatile a player he really is. I guess an excellent point because, Shap, I also think that, you know, we, we now found out we got a lot more than we thought we were going to get. I think he found out it's way better than he thought it would be. I get a feeling he feels like he's back at LSU again. Like surrounded by all these players, a chance to win it all every time you go on the field. Uh, and I think that's rejuvenated him to his versatility. And to me, the overall feeling of the safety group would be versatile. If I had to say why this group is so good, they are versatile. Let's just look at some numbers. Uh, pro football focus numbers, take it with a grain of salt, Surgeon General's warning. But his coverage grade was 82. Excellent. Top 16 overall. But here's what's interesting about the Honey Badger. Yeah, he had four picks. He also left four or five on the field. Think of the Mexico City game. He'll get those in 2020. Um, and the NFL high was six, and he had four. So he gets four more. He might lead the league. But 388 snaps in the box, mm -hmm. Tyron Matthew. He had 561 as a slot corner. So there's your point on his versatility. Yeah, and then when you watch him. Uh, about the, the interceptions. He is a guy who is so hard on himself about making those plays because he knows how rare it is for you to get one just to fall in your hand. You talk about that Mexico City. It was like a gift is dropped from heaven and he <laughs> and it slipped through his hands. That one still bugs him. You can, you can tell by his demeanor, that one particularly still bugs him. But there's a number of plays where he considers uh, there, there is an opportunity him for him to to trick the offensive coordinator, to trick the, the quarterback into thinking um, you have a window to throw this ball. And then like, like a honey badger, like a, like a trap being sprung, he goes in the action and makes a play and gets his hand on the ball. Um, but the amount of pass breakups, I, 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 look at, I, I think about that play he played against um, at Denver in the snow against um, Cortland Sutton. 
the ball is never complete until he until he finishes the play. And he's able to punch a ball out that in most situations would be a touchdown that ends up being incomplete. They don't score that drive. Um, and it's almost like a seven point swing um, because of that one play. And he's finished. He's finished uh, uh, um, drives or finished third down, got us off the field so many times because he comes up and makes a big hit, a big pass breakup. And also from a communication standpoint, he gets everybody else lined up with the right amount of leverage so they can be in positions to make um, great plays. And he's so hard on not only himself, but the other guys in that secondary. Um, like you said, a lot of the, a lot of his, his, his versatility – and his uh, commitment to this defense, this secondary being a top, uh, top, top defense in the league, is the way he communicates that with the other players out there on the field. He also studies this whole room studies, uh, and I think of the play against the Raiders where he actually baits Derek Carr <laughs> into the interception, where he he knew Carr's reads on that play. Yes, right. And so he knew the Carr's eyes and thoughts were going to go to that second option. He was there waiting on it. That's a pro's pro. He also took a Twitter pick during the Super Bowl week, maybe violated the rules of the team, don't take pictures inside that, but it was a picture late at night. And That's he took right. a picture of Dan Sorensen studying extra late at night in the DB's room, the safety's room at the team hotel. And it told you everything you need to know about one of the most underrated players, and I'm thinking maybe the most underrated player on this team in Dan Sorensen. Let's talk about his versatility. He had, in 2019, 109 snaps considered on the defensive line. Spags will run six and seven DBs, and Sorensen will actually be playing in a gap like a defensive lineman. As a box safety, Sorensen played 333 snaps, 147 as a slot corner. We say, we've seen him in his career make explosive plays. He has tormented Phillip Rivers all his career. He closes out the Mexico City game, but Dan Sorensen and his value to this team can be really easily underrated. Especially when we put in the phase of special teams, the fourth down stop, the uh, fake punt stop. Though, If those plays aren't made, I'm not sure we would even been in a position to go and come back from the, uh, the, uh, to, for the 49ers in the Super Bowl. That play against the Houston Texans, when when they when they kind of felt we were getting the momentum back and they decided to go for it on fourth down with that fake punt, having a player as heads up and headsy as Sorensen on the field, he was he was by himself. There was nobody else to make that tackle. If he doesn't make it, that guy runs for another 40 yards probably and puts them in scoring position. He makes that play, turnover, we score. Now it's it, it's Katie Bar the gate. The momentum is swung. It's now the Kansas City Chiefs here in Arrowhead Stadium taking that game away from the Houston Texans. And now history is able to rewrite itself. Those plays, and that's just one of many throughout the season where, where Dirty Dan has come up to make an outstanding fourth down stop or a big third down play to set up uh, what would be a, 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 a memorable comeback by the Kansas City Chiefs. His study as well. He knew he watched the personal protector on that play. He knew something was up. So his study and his instinct, and then he and Alex Brown make the hit on the kickoff return where the ball flies up and Darwin Thompson gets it. So another big-time special teams play by Dan Sorensen, his versatility to cover, play the run. Uh, he's a lot better athlete than he's given credit for. I mean, you look at his body mass, and, I mean, he's just so lean and uh, mm -hmm. just a phenomenal athlete. That segues into another phenomenal athlete, and that's one Thornhill. The more I was around him last year, one of the things, I'll be honest with you, I'm missing being around our rookies in this offseason because I get a chance to get to know him a little bit. And, man, I loved Juan Thornhill last year, even before we stepped on the field in St. Joe. So I'm a little bit anxious because I haven't been around the Bo Peak Keyses, right, and yes, the Thurston Sneeds and, and, and Willie Gay Jr. and Clyde Edwards-Alaire. But in the case of Thornhill, I go, this guy could be really, really special, not just as a player, but as a leader on this team. Again, versatility, again, athleticism, a 41-inch vertical. The guy could have played Division I basketball. Uh, his explosive play against the Raiders on the pick six. Uh, he also is versatile. He played 222 snaps in the box before his injury. And on 30 attempts, when teams going after him 30 times, there's only 20 or only 10 times he was burned on a play. 
That's a 33% uh, percentage, which is outstanding for any player, more or less a rookie. Now, we don't know about his injury coming back, his injury rehab. We haven't been able to see him, how that's going. But Juan Thornhill, to me, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but he looks to me like a potential Ring of Honor player. Well, he follows a line of guys coming out of that uh, UVA backfield. UVA has a storybook uh, history, a, a lineage of secondary guys that have entered the league. Um, and, and, and they have always held themselves to a pros pro mentality. They come into the league ready to start. They're not, they come in with that learning curve. They, they don't treat them like rookies. They come in as uh, with the expertise of how to take their proper angles to the ball, how important it is to have the right footwork, mirability, um, understanding uh, NFL pro defenses. And so they're, they're the learning curve coming out of a UVA um, defensive backfield entering the league is a little bit different. And so I kind of uh, followed Juan Thorne here, being a Virginia guy myself. Um, so I, I, his mental uh, ability was way beyond his physical ability. And so whatever he's done at the combine and shown his great 40 speed and explosive sniffing as the uh, vertical jump and broad jump, I also knew that he had the, the common sense and he had the, the brain and the mental powers to process Coach Spagnuolo's defense and, and be able to be used interchangeably um, with Honey Badger and Sorensen. When we think about that three safety look, you have no idea which safety is going to be in the box, which is going to be covering your number two receiver or uh, the slot receiver, and who's going to be the whole safety or who's going to be the deep safety. So those three guys are being are being used so interchangeably, it 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 doesn't allow an offensive coordinator or a quarterback to get it any comfort of thinking they know exactly who is doing what and going where. And before you know it, that guy's released and he's in the backfield making a sack. You think he's coming and now he's dropping to a deep hole or you think he's a deep hole guy and now he's robbing a middle uh, a slant route or a robber route. And that's what led to that Raiders game. Um, Juan Thornhill making that quick read and reaction, uh, robbing that slant for a pick six. In that look, you make it. he makes it seem like he's a deep safety. Right before the snap, he takes one read step, and then he plants and goes on that slant. That is something that most safeties aren't able to do, and most teams don't have enough uh, variation in their defense to allow all three safeties to do all three jobs because they all don't do it at a high enough level. You mentioned his intelligence. I always like to bring up he was an anthropology major at the University (laughs) of Virginia, high school quarterback, came from kind of a small school background. But there's a lot to this guy and a lot to like. But I want to ask you dovetail on your on your thoughts about the interchangeable because I love to see the way Spags uses use these guys. All can cover all three guys, but all can play the run. To me, they're all three very good tacklers, and yeah. we've seen them make some open field tackles. I mean, one hates the tackle miss on Derrick Henry in the sixty nine yard run <laughs> against Tennessee on November the tenth. But so many times in watching the video. Juan Thornhill can play a gap and make a tackle. All three of these guys, when you look at the Honey Badger and Tyron Matthew Sorensen and Thornhill, all can cover, but they all can play physically. Yeah, I think Juan had a great fourth down stop or a, a big third down stop against the Ravens in that win. Um, so there's it's so many it's so many opportunities he's had to make uh, key stops, um, um, whether it was for a minimum gain or just just shab the sticks. The one thing, you know, we go back to that, that you know, against King Henry. King Henry has been a, a monster running back for, for anybody to get down. And now you have a rookie into the league thinking he's going to be able to stop King Henry. It didn't get accomplished. But I think what he realized from that moment is I got to still rise to the occasion. I got to lift my game up. I'm, whatever we're doing here for us to be good, that's not always going to be good enough. And so if, if, there, if there's a, a weakness in his game, um, it's, it's, the, it's the tackling. And it's not that it's a a, 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 a a something that makes him not a great player. It's just something for him to improve on. Everybody in this defense has something they can improve on. And for all three safeties, I think that they take their tackling um, and their, their, their lack of missed tackles is something they all hang their hats on. They all want to be very high-rated um, tackling. And they, they, they know that the way the defense is schemed, because so many times they're rolled into the box, they're going to be come, coming downhill and having to be a D-gap, C-gap player. And most running plays, when they cut back, cut back to that C or D-gap. 
and they have to be very sure tacklers. So they understand their role in the defense. And I think they take that as like a badge of honor to be a guy who's 210 pounds having to go against a guy 240 and you still are uh, accountable to get him down. So um, I, I think that's another way to just kind of refocus them on on how great this team can really be when everybody is playing their positions at a real high level. That's the attitude as well. We talk about Patrick being able to absorb what Alex Smith gave him mm -hmm. in 2017. Juan Thornhill now has the benefit of having Tyron Matthew and Daniel Sorensen, and Juan absorbs that. Juan, this guy, yes, Thornhill's a leader in the making. I mean, he's kind of a honey badger in the making to me, and so it's exciting to, to see what he can do. It leads us now to the fourth main safety and that's a guy that, honestly, I get asked a lot, well, who are you excited about that I'm not thinking of? You know, mm -hmm. whether it's in a public forum on an interview show or or people in a private discussion. Well, who, who am I not thinking? I, and it almost always, I'll mention Armani Watts. Yes, sir. I am so excited about the potential of Armani Watts. I saw enough in 18 before he tore his ACL in a Jacksonville game to think this guy. Can he fit eyes here now? He's got the ability to play the run. He can be uh, he can be very versatile in Spags' system. And last year, ten special teams tackles. Mm -hmm. He led the team. So he's athletic. He can play physical. He can cover. But I'm excited about Armani Watts and where he fix, fits into this picture in 2020. The one thing I think Armani Watts does, he understands that special team is a is a is a. It gives you the opportunity to kind of sharpen your teeth, because in special teams you have to block and then cover. You have to do so many different things on a single play. It, it, it only uh, benefits the versatility of your skill set. And so when you have to, you know, uh, sprint 60 yards, break down, be able to cover a, a 20 yard span of field, make a tackle, shed, uh, punch the ball. You have to do all those things every time on special team. You have to be a gunner and also be a vice, right? Covering kickoffs, covering punts. That, 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 that uses so many of your talents and your abilities on a play by play level. When it's time to now go play your normal defense, you're already uh, you're already playing at a high level. It, it does a, a tremendous job for guys um, for their own personal confidence as far as are they uh, able to really make plays at this at, at this level against this kind of competition. And like you said, the times he's been out there and given the opportunity to go play, the defense hasn't missed a beat. Um, whether the teams wanted to target him or not. Um, he's always rose to the occasion with every opportunity he's been given. It's just that he's in a room with so much talent. You said it was Sorensen, Honey Badger, and Juan Thornhill. It's hard to find that guy some, some quality playing time, some quality reps. But what we know from what Coach Andy Reid does on a normal practice schedule, he'll pull a guy out. He'll say, hey, now the twos are going in with the ones. Uh, he wants to be ready for when that injury does happen, that those twos and threes do not miss a beat. Everybody's expected to know the entire playbook. We're not going to dumb down or water down any calls based off of injury. And so that's the accountability piece that uh, Amani Watts has to take into work every day. He has to prepare himself like he is a starter each and every day. Yeah, to me, and it's one of the brilliant things Andy Reid does, is that whole fire drill situation. <laughs> you got to be ready. He'll do it when you least expect it. And, hey, throw in there. Now you're now you're there. You're with the varsity. What are you going to do? Uh and let's be honest, losing Kendall Fuller to free agency, Fuller helped this team, especially after Thornhill's injury. Where then uh, he became that Thornhillish safety, right? Uh, and we saw him, of course, cap it off with the interception in the Super Bowl. Kansas City, you've got a champion. That was the call. Uh, but to me, Watts can play that role. Uh, he can be that next guy right there uh, that could uh, to help this team. Overall, the safety group. And so you're thinking, well, with 53 guys, how many in the past, usually it has been five corners, four safeties. Mm -hmm. And the younger corners uh, become part of this discussion because how are you going to put this together when you put the 53-man uh, roster together? But if it's those four safeties that we've discussed on this podcast, I'm telling you, Shop, I'll take those four to anybody in the league and say what you got. Because it kind of gives me a Seattle-ish legion of doom feeling. Yeah, and even if you go to some of the, 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 the teams that have, like, two really good safeties, you look at who they got behind those guys, and, and the cover gets a little thin. It gets thin really quick. And that, that playability, the, the level of play drops significantly after their first two safeties come off the field. If you're talking about a four-deep um, evaluation, if you got to go four-deep, 
You can go across the NFL, 31 teams. You cannot find a four deep room of safeties better than what we have at, here at Kansas City. I'm with you. It's exciting. We're getting closer. I know the rules change every day. I'm trying to figure out when we're going to get out there, uh, shop. But when we do, it's going to be exciting. Uh, but this safety group is in one other reason. The Chiefs kingdom can get real fired up to run it back. Man, we got so many reasons to be excited. You t- we talk about 20 of 22 starters coming back. We talk about the communication, having the same system in place. I think that's one of the things that usually gets overseen, overlooked. The amount of teams that have new coaching staffs, new philosophies, um, even some of the teams that, that even last year we saw in the playoffs, the Houston Texans, that, that was a team that was successful last year. They got a new defensive coordinator. They're going with Anthony Peeler instead of uh, Romeo Cornell. So that's a – not only the system might change, but the, the communication, the, yeah. the what, what calls to expect in certain situations. Not here in Kansas City. We have so much consistency – throughout the, the coaching staff, the roster. And when you take a Super Bowl winning team and you bring back that much consistency, it, it, it's hard not to think that the the expectation should not be through the roof. The expectation for 2020, 21, and 22, keeping these things similar, keeping these things um, um, with, with the, the least amount of uh, volunteer to, uh, you know, volatility as possible, it, it, it all plays into a, a storybook next three or four years and i'm so glad to be a part of that i'm glad to be able to share these experiences and these conversations with the voice of the chiefs mitch holtis um it it just it makes an amazing ride to be a part of i love getting to go to the barber shop every time when we do these it's exciting get ready we're getting closer to camp and hopefully you know we're going to be on time and ready to roll but he's sean barber 10-year nfl veteran here we go shop Mitch Holtis voice the Chiefs together. We'll run this back. Yes, sir. Thanks for listening to the Chiefs official podcast network. Ten, five, touchdown! Lock it down! And the celebration begins at 